I was thinking this week about professional sports. Remember when we used to go to games and there was like big crowds? Do you remember that? Yeah. Seems like it was a long time ago, at least a year ago now. Uh, but what's one of the things that you could do when you showed up to a crowd of people who were really excited for a game is you could wear a jersey. And I'm one of those people that always wanted a jersey of my favorite team. My favorite team growing up was the New York Yankees. So sometimes what I would do just to kind of do this was I would wear a Yankees jersey occasionally to like an Angels game, okay? And the Yankees weren't even playing. Have you seen that guy before? Yeah. That guy's just kind of asking for it, okay? Um, I did that, but not that much. I was kind of embarrassed. I didn't want, I kind of wanted to fit in. So sometimes when I went to Angels games, I just wear red. I didn't have any Angels. I was never an Angels fan. You know, I, I grew up here, was never an Angels fan, so I never had any Angel stuff. But something that I also did sometimes is if you go to a game where big rivals are playing. You ever gone to a game that's like a rivalry game? Maybe if you're like a USC fan or you grew up, maybe your parents went to USC, they play against the, the Bruins. They're kind of rivals with them. They're also kind of rivals with Notre Dame. That was a big rivalry growing up. Maybe not, no. Uh, UCLA versus USC, that's a big one right there. Uh, the UCI Anteaters versus uh, the UC Santa Barbara Slugs. <laughs> what are they? The slu- what are they? What are they? Oh, the Gauchos. Who's the Banana Slugs? Santa Cruz. See, you, well, you were a Gaucho. See, sometimes when you grow up around here and you talk about the Gauchos, you're usually talking about Saddleback College. Okay. You, 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 uh, is it USC, University of Saddleback College, UCLA, University of of California left on Avery. That's it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But sometimes you go to a game and people are like all dressed up. I've been dressed up at games before. One time I went to a Yankees-Red Sox game in Yankee Stadium. I got dressed up for that. I wore wore the Yankee shirt. My brother growing up was a Red Sox fan. Did you know that? Some of you are Red Sox fans. You don't have to moan for that. That's okay. We're in California. It doesn't really matter. But I will never forget him riding on the subway, going to Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium, wearing a Red Sox jersey. That got a little interesting. Uh, New York fans, they're not, they're not as nice, maybe, to the people that, don't, that aren't like them. And that's okay. It's just because they really like their team a lot. Uh, they're just not quite as nice. And he, he was a little kid. He's probably 12 years old. But I remember him still getting some hate. I remember a couple years later, we went to Boston, and I wore my Yankee stuff in Boston. I experienced the pain of uh, you know, kind of being the only one. I was kind of hated a little bit. Uh, people throwing stuff at me, um, punching me. I'm just kidding. No, I have heard stories about that, though. Have you ever heard of the, those stories? People going to games and getting beat up? Yeah, I was going to say, someone, someone went to a, a Dodgers game wearing some, uh, some San Francisco Giants apparel. They actually got killed. So sometimes you go to different games, right? You can face different levels of opposition. Maybe people just will look at you funny. Other games you go to, maybe people will yell at you. Other games, people might throw stuff at you or want to hurt you. And other games, there have been times where people have actually gotten hurt. And I want you to picture that, that idea of you're wearing the jersey of a rival team at an away game. You're in someone else's house and you are representing another team. Imagine being that person. Pick your sport, pick your teams, whatever. Imagine you walk in and you're one of the only ones wearing that jersey. Well, that is actually what Jesus compares our Christian life to right there. Jesus says that when we go out into the world, it's like we're living in in a world that's hostile and he promises something. He says, if you're going to live for me and if you're really going to be a Christian, the scary reality is you're going to be hated. But he gives that to us very clearly and he's very upfront about that. Jesus does not want us to be surprised if we live in the world and we act like Christians and live like Christians and people don't like us. Jesus says that's actually what you should expect. So I want you all to grab those Bibles we talked about earlier and turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 18. We're going to see what Jesus says here about living in a world that doesn't quite like us. I want you all to grab your Bibles. I see some of you guys need your Bibles. Yeah, I see you guys. Grab your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, go grab one right now. Or you can go sit by a leader who's got one. Yeah. Grab a Bible. So John 15, we talked about it last week. We opened it up and looked at the first 17 verses. These first 17 verses are all about Jesus telling the Christians who are listening to him, you need to continue a relationship with me, even when I'm gone. You need to stay plugged in with me so much so that it's like I never left. That's how plugged in I want you to be with me. The word that he uses is abide. He says, abide in me. 
Stay connected to me. Then he says, I want you to love one another. That's verse 12 of, of this section. He says, I want you to love one another. That's my commandment to you. Make sure that when I'm gone, you are loving one another in this Christian family. Then in verse 18, there's a big shift. There's a big change that happens. And you might even see it in your Bibles. There might be a different heading above verse 18. I want everyone to take their eyeballs. Look down at John chapter 15, verse 18. Here's what Jesus says. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And sometimes we read that and say, okay, well, if the world hates you, that, it's not a promise that the world's going to hate, right? I mean, it's just saying, Jesus is just saying, maybe if the world doesn't like you very much, just know it hated me before it hated you. Well, that's partially true, but this if statement is not saying if it might happen. It's saying this is going to happen if the world hates you. Keep reading. Verse 19 kind of proves that a little bit more. It says, if you were of the world, if you live like the world, if you talk like the world, if you dress like the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Which basically is saying this. If you're a Christian that's really been chosen and lifted, in a sense, out of the world, what does that mean? Does that mean we're all teleporting around? No, that's not what we're talking about, right? But what Jesus is trying to say is, my people, I've chosen you to be different than the rest of the world, which means because you're not a part of their group anymore, because you're not on their team anymore, because you're not wearing their jersey anymore, they're not going to like you. And different people are going to experience different levels of hatred from the world. But he does say, just know that if you experience that, it's because you're living for me. Verse 20 says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So he already said that. He said that in chapter 13. And the context of that was Jesus was saying, if I served you as your servant, you need to serve one another. It was that scene where they were washing feet. Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. Basically saying, if, you, if I'm the master and I'm serving, you need to serve one another too. Jesus uses that same phrase and he says, remember how I said that to you? It also applies here. Because a servant is not greater than his master. Guess what? The world hated Jesus. The world hated Jesus. And in some ways, it still does. Look what he says. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I want you to think, what has happened? Where is Jesus right here? Right? Like physically, where is he geographically? When he's speaking these words, right? we said he's, this is the upper room discourse. It's the night before his death. What kind of persecution is Jesus about to face? What kind of opposition or even physical threats to his life is Jesus about to face right here? He's literally about to be killed, tortured, stripped, mocked, beaten up. And he says, just know before all that happens, if they persecute me, guess what's going to happen to you? Same thing. Maybe to different degrees, but still, you're going to be hated by the world. Then he also says, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. That's a helpful little promise that even though the, the majority of the world is not going to like how you live, there will be people who listen to what you say about Jesus and they will keep your word. They will obey what you say. You, they will respond to the gospel of Jesus. There will be people who do that. Verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know the one who sent me. Jesus says the problem with people persecuting you is not that they hate you for some reason for you. He's saying they hate you because of me. That's, that's why, you know, that when you, you go to a sporting event and you wear the jersey of a team that's not the majority that's represented there, they hate you. Why do they hate you, right? What did you ever do to them? If you were just wearing a different jersey, they would embrace you and love you. It's the same idea that because you're part of a different group that they don't like, Jesus says you're going to be hated. Verse 22 Jesus says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. I don't think Jesus is saying they wouldn't have done any sin. Clearly, they're guilty of sin. But I want you to think, when Jesus shows up on the scene, what does he do? What does he say? He, he basically says, hey, everybody, I, I can take away your sins. Everybody, turn from your sins. Pointing out even to the people who thought they were religious that if your religion or your, your following God is not really from the heart and if you don't really trust God, even that is worthless. He came and he called out all these different groups of people. But what he told them to do was turn to him and trust him for eternal life. 
Jesus says, if I didn't come and say that message, they would not be as guilty. Would they still be guilty of their sin? Sure, but they wouldn't be as guilty. And now that they've heard the good news and it's been offered to them and they said, no, I don't want to listen to you. Because that happened, Jesus says, it's like their guilt goes way up because they have no excuse for their sin. Verse 23, whoever hates me hates my father also. The, the people who really were about to kill Jesus, they said they loved God. They were the Jewish people, the religious people. They said, oh, we, we love God. We love God. And Jesus, you don't even know God. You hate God if you hate me, which they were about to show. Verse 24, if I had done, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and the Father. Jesus says that all the works that he did, the miracles that he did, turning water to wine, making loaves appear out of nowhere, because he did all those things and he did it in front of them and he had a purpose for that. His purpose was believe in me, believe in my father who sent me, believe that I'm his representative. Because all of that happened, Jesus says, it's like I offered it to them and because they said no, just know that their guilt is, is, is extremely high now. Same principle applies today. People who sit in these chairs are more responsible for what they know about God's word than people who don't sit in these chairs. You are more responsible because of what you've known about Jesus than the person who sits next to you at school because maybe they don't know as much about Jesus as you do. But because you're here, you're gonna be held responsible in a different way. That's what Jesus said about the generation that he was preaching to. He goes on, verse 25. But, the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. That right there is a quotation from Psalm 69, 4. Psalm chapter 69, verse 4. Jesus is quoting that because it's something that David said about himself. It's like he had these enemies and why do they hate David in the Old Testament? Well, is it because David was mean to them? Was it because David was rude or because David was horrible to them? No, it wasn't because of any of that. It's just because God was blessing David and they were envious of him. They did not like David. And Jesus says, it's like me. I feel that same pain here. Verse 26, Jesus offers some encouragement. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. That, that, that paints the picture of a person in a courtroom. I was in a courtroom semi recently. I got called in for jury duty and it was super uncomfortable. And I had to go up to Santa Ana to the courthouse. I had got called in like for three different days. And because of COVID, all the stuff was spread out. And finally they settled and they dropped the case. So I never had to even be, you know, a juror in that sense. But there were going to be people who would come up and testify. And they'd be people who said, I saw this person commit this crime. Right? It was a guy who, whatever, it's just weird, but I can talk about it now. Um, it's so, uh, armed robbery. Okay. That was what the case was about. So there were going to be people who would stand up and say, I saw this guy steal the money from that lady. There are going to be people who would bear witness about what they saw. Jesus says, when I leave, there's going to be someone else who comes and bears witness about me. I have been bearing witness about God. Jesus is saying, it's like I'm a person in a courtroom saying, this is what God said. And he speaks it out. He says, when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit's going to do that. And guess who else is going to do that? Verse 27, and you are going to be put at the podium. You are going to have to speak for me when I'm gone. You will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These disciples have known Jesus for a long time. Look at verse one of the next chapter. We've got four more verses here. He says, I said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. I don't want you to be surprised about what you hear. I don't want you to fall away, which is about to happen to these people. If you remember who he's talking to, they're about to see Jesus taken away. So the disciples remember Peter, remember James and John and what happened to all of them. When Jesus was betrayed, what did they do? They, did they stick around and say, I'm going to hang out with Jesus and get killed with him tonight? No, they ran away. Jesus says, I'm telling all this to you so you don't fall away, at least not completely. There's a danger in knowing persecution's coming because it might make us scared. Verse two, is they will be put out of, they will put you out of the synagogues, right, which was the common meeting place for these people. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Could you imagine being told that? Could you imagine Jesus comes up to you and says, there's going to be people who are probably going to kill you. And when they do, they, think they're, they will think they're serving God. They're not killing you because they think they're doing the wrong thing. They're going to kill you and they're going to say, this was right. God is pleased with me for putting you to death. 
That's what Jesus says to these disciples. And that's what happened. But verse three, they will do these things because they've not known God. They have not known the Father and they have not known me. Verse four, but I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. He says, I'm warning you, giving you all this information so that when it happens, you don't have to freak out. You don't have to be worried or concerned or act like, wow, what happened? I have no idea what's going on. Because when you are hated, just know if you are hated for Jesus, that is exactly what Jesus promised. That's the big overarching message of this section of scripture. Jesus says, if you are hated for me, just know that is right on schedule. That is exactly what you should expect. We should expect to be rejected. We should expect opposition from the world, at least if you're going to live like Jesus. And, and that's kind of the first problem here. We're going to look at this section of verses one by one, but I want you to realize before we even get into it, you will not be hated by the world for being different from the world if you're not different from the world. Okay, I know that's just a logical thing. That doesn't even come from the passage, but I want you to even understand that from the beginning. Okay, if Jesus says the world is going to hate you because you're not like the world and you act so much different than the world and you don't embrace the fashion of the world, you don't embrace the, the, the talk of the world and the words of the world and the media of the world and they'll hate you for that. Okay, I want us to take a pause, time out and say, is that even reflective of me? Am I even different from the world or am I just like everybody else? Or is that what I'm like? Point number one, I want you to write this down at the top of your paper. Make sure you are not aligned with the world. Make sure you aren't aligned with the world. Please make sure, because all of this stuff about you will be hated, just know that does not even apply to people who act like the world. That does not apply to them. Because sometimes people will look at this and say, oh, you're hated. Oh, that means if I go through hard times, like that means Jesus is on my side in those hard times. It, it could mean that, but that's not really what he's saying. He's, this is a very particular promise to a particular group of people. And all I want you to do is figure out, am I even in that particular group of people that Jesus is talking to? Does this even apply to me? He says, the world will hate you because you don't live like the world. Here's my question for you. And I want you to ask yourself this. Don't think about anybody else. Don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about whatever. Think about yourself right now. Do you live just like the world? And if we put your life and everything you say, and the way you treat your parents, and the way you treat your siblings, and the stuff you look at, and the music you listen to, and the clothes you wear, and we put that all up on a whiteboard, let's just say. And then we put another person's life all up on a whiteboard, and they don't know God. They don't go to church, anything like that. How different do those lives actually look? Or it means it basically all kind of the same stuff. Because Jesus is not talking to you in this passage if it's all the same stuff. He's talking to the, a different group of people. He's talking to the people that live differently than the world. There's some scriptures that talk about this, and I want you to write these down. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. 1 John 3, 12 and 13 says something very interesting, that this has been going on since the beginning. Okay, if you think back in, in your Bibles, right, who are the first people that ever lived? I right, say Adam and Eve. Okay? Who are their two sons? What were their names? Right? They're two first, Cain and Abel, right? Here's what the Apostle John says in his letter. He says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? This might be new information to you, right? The first two brothers that ever lived, one of them killed the other one. And John says here, well, that was because he was evil and he was being evil. But he says, why did he murder him? Why did the, the bad son kill the good son? Why did that happen? is because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous, okay? If you've got evil people and righteous people, guess what's gonna happen? The evil people will not like the righteous people. It just won't happen. And you might say, well, wait a minute. If you're righteous and that means you're loving and you're kind and you're doing the right thing and you're keeping the rules, why would people hate you for that, right? Then if you think back in your mind, oh, I know what that's like. That's like me at school being the only one who's keeping the rules and everybody not liking that. Oh, it is kind of like that, isn't it? When maybe all your siblings are doing something wrong and they're all, you know, maybe if you're doing school from home, they're all cheating on tests and you say, I'm not going to cheat on anything. I'm not going to do that. God says, don't do that. I'm like, oh, what are you? You think you're so much better than, like, now they hate you, right? Maybe hate with a, with a lowercase h. Maybe they don't hate you, hate you, but they're definitely opposing you. The next verse in that section, John says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. 
Remember that if their deeds are evil and you're doing righteous things, don't be surprised that the world hates you because it was just like Cain and Abel. It was just like the righteous brother and the unrighteous brother. What happens? Unrighteous brother hates the righteous brother because he knows he's evil in his heart and he knows that they're doing the right thing and that makes him mad. The world will hate you if you live righteously because you live so much different than them. On the flip side, okay, Romans chapter one, verse 32. This is Romans 1, 32. Here's what it says if you want to indulge in sin. Here's what, here's what the world will say about you. It says the people that know God's righteous decrees and people who practice such evil things, they deserve to die. They not only do evil deeds, they also give approval to those who practice them. Okay? I just want you to see those two truths. If you act righteously, the world will hate you. Which is hard for us to make sense, but we know what it's like in experience if we think about it. Okay? On the other hand, if you live sinfully, guess what the world's going to do? They're going to praise you. Okay? They give approval to things that are wrong, that God's word says is wrong, that their conscience says is wrong. They will give approval to those things, which is why, if you think back to your own experience, okay, when you're the only one at school doing the right thing, and everybody else at the lunch table is saying those bad words, talking about those bad things, laughing at those bad jokes, watching those bad videos, and they're all doing that, and you're not. They're gonna like you and say, oh, that's so good that you don't do that. I'm just, wow, virtuous person. Right? No, they're not going to say that. They're going to hate you for it. But they'll, once you start indulging in that and start laughing with their jokes, guess what they're going to do? They're going to praise you. Wow, you're such a, he's such a funny guy. Wow, she's so cool. She's so popular. I mean, look at, she's dressing exactly like us. She's doing exactly the same things. Listen to the same music. I love that person because you in, indulged in the wrong thing. Right? Sometimes you just got to realize those two truths, although they're hard for us to grasp, that is how our world is. That's why, in that same book that John wrote, he said, don't love the world or the things in the world. That's 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And I want you to ask yourself that right now. Do I love the things of the world? First of all, am I like the world? That's a first good place to start. Is my life exactly like their life? And then once I think, oh, there are some things that I, that I am like with the world. I listen to the same music they do. I say the same bad words they do. I laugh at the same jokes they do. Right? Oh, maybe I'm kind of like the world in that sense. Everybody else. Well, now I want you to ask the question, do you love that? Like, how much do you love those things? How much is that worth to you? Because Jesus makes it pretty clear that these promises are for the people who are, that are living differently. They're not for you if you're living just like the world. But if you are living differently, right, and you want to live more differently, you want to live more like Christ when the world doesn't want to do that, you got to have this thought in your mind. Okay, do I love those things? And what can I just, I, what can I let go of? Because if I said, hey, you know, if you're going to live for Christ and if you're going to be more godly, you know, one of the things you should stop doing is stop taking in all that, that garbage. You should stop listening to that bad music or watching those bad shows because that would really help you live more for Christ. I wonder if you do it or I wonder if you love those things more, love those things too much. Or if I said, hey, you know, if you really want to start growing in your godliness, you know, maybe what you're wearing could be a hindrance to that. Maybe what you're wearing might be immodest. And it might be wrong and sinful and leading other people to sin. I wonder how much you're willing to let go of that. I wonder how much you love it in your heart. I mean, these are big things. These are big grown-up ideas that Jesus is giving at us right here. He says, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't say, he says, you love God if you love the world at the same time. And you're not willing to repent of those sins. Because even think about it in those sense. If you're not willing to repent of a sin, if it's like you got all your sins and you lay them all out before God and say, yeah, I, w I don't want to do any of these things anymore. Oh, but there's this like one thing I kind of want to keep doing. There's this one thing I I'd like to do at school that I wouldn't want to give up because that would make me not cool. Jesus says, okay, I guess you haven't repented of your sin yet. You haven't laid it all out before me yet. Come back to me when you want to lay it all out and I'll forgive you of all your sins. The question is, do I blend in with the world? Philippians chapter two, verse 15 says, God wants us to be lights in the world. He says, don't complain, don't grumble or complain, knowing that you want to be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. People will see your different actions and they will not like it. Some of them might, but others won't like it. Just realize, am I willing to step out and be like that? 
Or am I just so focused on blending in and fitting in that I have to be aligned with the world? And just realize if that's you, that's where your heart is. Your love is there. Your love is not with God if that's where your heart is. Jesus reminds them that he was like a stumbling block to the people. I want you to think about that. When Jesus came along, okay, what was his life like to all the people that saw him? Would anyone have hated Jesus? Like if you saw him live and you saw him act, would you hate him? You probably initially say, well, I wouldn't hate Jesus. Because I mean, he was good. He was always helping people, always doing good to people. Always, he's healing people. He's helping people with their problems. He's preaching the good news. That seems like all good stuff until sometimes it's directed at us. Until Jesus says, if you don't repent, you will likewise perish. Luke 13. John 7, 7, Jesus said, the world cannot hate you. And he was talking to the people who are accepted in that society. He says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. Now that's kind of taking a step beyond just the lifestyle, right? Jesus says, it's not just that I live righteously and they don't. The other thing they don't like me for is I'm telling them that they're, that they're in sin. And now some of us might say, well, I'm willing to live differently, but I could, I could never tell someone they're in the wrong. Because that is like the biggest, like that's the big sin of our day. I couldn't ever tell anybody that they were doing something that God didn't like. I, I, I would be too afraid to, right? Just know that's what Jesus did. And he did it perfectly. And it's sometimes hard for us and we can be a little afraid, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do that. That's really what he gets to in this passage in verses 22 all the way to 27. First of all, Jesus says, I was a witness in the world. I stood out and people didn't like me and they didn't accept me. I did miracles and all that stuff and they didn't embrace me. He says, now I'm going to send you out and guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to represent me too and some people will embrace you and some won't. Some will obey what you say about God and others won't. But the point is for us, we need to be bold enough to speak up for Jesus. That's point number two. Be bold enough to speak up for Jesus. That's his main point here. And he says, just know you have the Holy Spirit that's going to help bear witness. He's going to speak through you, right? How can you change someone's heart? You can't. How can you change someone's mind on the inside, right? That's hard to do. Right? You have to be really persuasive or really amazing. And there's some people that you could never change. Some people that are stuck in their ways and they could never change. But here's the thing. Jesus says here in verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, it's going to be sent from the Father. He's the spirit of truth. He's going to proceed from the Father and he will bear witness about me. He will go even into people's hearts and tell them the truth about him. That people who, who don't go to church, who don't listen to anything about God, all of a sudden they're going to be different and something's going to happen in their heart and it's going to be changed and then he's going to use what you say, that message of the gospel, and their life is going to be changed. How is that possible? That's called impossible if it's just you doing it. But he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to do it. In the old days, at hotels, I don't know if you've ever been in a hotel that does this, there was something called a wake-up call. You know what a wake-up call is? Right? You might know figuratively what it is. It's when they would call your room and say, hi, this is your wake-up call, 5.30 in the morning. You guys ever experienced this? Raise your hand if this has ever happened. You ever been in a hotel and your parents ordered a wake-up call? Yeah? Have you ever been in a hotel where they don't have phones and they have to come to your door yourself? All right, anybody? No, I, I, I looked it up today. I was like, I wonder what they did before there were phones. Apparently, what the first wake-up calls, someone would go to your room, they'd knock on the door, and they'd say, hi, it's your 5.30 wake-up call. What, what, what would that be like if you're sleeping and someone knocks on your door at 5.30 in the morning? Say, it's your wake-up. You, your mom does it, right? But she comes in at 7, she opens the blinds, she says, you got to start on your school, right? Or whatever life looks like for you right now. Um, you know how your, your mom or your dad comes in? See, my mom wouldn't do that. My dad would come in and just sweep the, the light, like the blinds. We had those, um, you know those curtains, yes. the blackout curtains, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would come in and we'd always hear him. And he'd open the door and just go straight to the window and just grab the, the blinds and just open them up. And you're just like, Ugh. you know what I'm talking about? Did this happen this morning to any of you? How many of you it happened this morning? Wow. I feel bad slightly for you slightly my wife kind of does it when she goes if she goes to the bathroom and turns the lights on that's right in my face and goes boom all right but imagine i said hey i have a career opportunity for you it's going to be great we're going to stay in this like vintage hotel you get to work you get to live in the hotel but here's your job you're the wake-up call person 
You have to go to people's doors at four in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning, knocking on their doors until they wake up and get you. Because you can't just, and then leave, right? There's no ding dong ditching with, with wake up calls. You have to stay there until they show up. Because if not, then they could just sleep through it and they say, where's my wake up call? I was like, well, you came, but you didn't listen, right? You've got to stay there. You're signing up for that. Imagine if that was your job. I'm just thinking, right? I don't know anybody who's ever done this before as a job or as a career. I'm just thinking it's probably not the best thing, right? Imagine being an alarm clock. I hate what my alarm sounds like, okay? Never make a song that you like your alarm because you will hate it over time. Why do you hate it? Because it wakes you up in the morning. It makes you get out of your bed, go across the room, get your phone. That's actually really helpful. If you want to wake up in the morning, don't set your alarm next to your bed because then you'll just hit it and then you'll go back to sleep. Have, put it somewhere else in the room where you got to get up, walk across the room to their place, and then you're like, oh, I'm already up. So um, I might as well get ready now. Anyway, that's life hack. But um, <laughs> imagine that was your job, being a wake-up call person. It'd be terrible because everyone would hate you because you are doing something for their good, but they don't want to hear it in the moment. It doesn't feel good to be woken up like that. I think you get what I'm saying. Jesus has basically said, you're going to be my witness in the world. And it's like, you're going to be a wake up call person. You're going to come, you're going to knock on people's doors, maybe figuratively, maybe literally. Um, and you're going to say, Hey, you need to repent of your sins. You know, Jesus says that he's willing to save you from all your sins, forgive you of everything wrong that you've ever done. But here's what he says. You got to recognize that God is there and that God created you and that he's good and you've sinned against him and you deserve his punishment. And people don't like that, right? That's kind of the wake up call part. People might be okay with God existing, but they don't like the idea that God demands something of them and they've fallen short. And then you also say, yeah, yeah, that, that's true too. But also Jesus has done something about your problem. And if you trust in him, if you trust in Jesus, he'll forgive you of all your sins, okay? So the wake-up call is not all bad, but just, you know, a lot of people are gonna shut the door back in your face. They don't wanna hear it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 through 16, this section, he says, it's like Jesus leads us in a parade. It's like, Jesus goes before us and we're like in a parade and he's leading the parade. And what happens is as he comes through the, the city, it says he leads us in triumphal procession and he spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. The idea is it's like if you have a big parade and everybody comes through and they've maybe got some barbecue going on this parade and everybody smells the barbecue. It's like, oh, there's a barbecue parade. And they all come out and say, what, what's, the, what's this parade all about? I smell the barbecue. It's like that. Jesus is saying, or Paul's saying in this passage, the fragrance of him goes out everywhere. But the problem is, for some people, that aroma or that fragrance, so to speak, of Christ, where people can sense that you're different and people can hear from your message that you're telling them to repent. To some people, that's a fragrance of life. They love that because they want to be saved. But to other people, it's a fragrance of death. It smells terrible to them. And they're smelling the same thing, so to speak. You could be the same way with one person as you are with another person, acting righteously, living righteously, sharing the gospel with them, asking them, please be saved. And to one of them, they're going to latch onto that and they're going to say, yes, I need that. Thank you so much. And there's going to be another person you do that to that's going to hate you for it. Both of those things are true. Even though you might act completely the same with both of them. Jesus says that you will be hated, but some will obey you. Others won't. Paul also said that if you're afraid one thing that you need to be doing is utilizing the Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus said, the Holy Spirit's going to help you, but how does it help you? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul says he wants to be praying at all times in the Spirit. Asking for what? That my words, that words might be given to me for opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. The Spirit wants you to be bold with the person in your class that you're thinking of. Spirit wants you to be bold when you think of the person on your street, your neighbor that you've never talked to about the gospel. The Spirit wants you to do all those things and he's going to help you if you open your mouth and if you ask him. That's what Jesus is promising here. That if you have to be a witness, just know you have another witness that's with you. The Spirit, he's gonna help you. 
And I want you to think about all this. If you're really going to speak up about people's sin, and you're really going to call them to some kind of repentance, some kind of turning from their sin, just know, do you think that's going to make most people like you more or hate you more, right? If they already hated you for living differently and living righteously when they live in an evil way, you think they're going to like you more for pointing that stuff out? No, it's just going to make things worse. That's what he goes on to say in chapter 16. He says, people are going to kill you and they're going to think they're offering service to God. He says, I'm telling you all this so that you don't fall away, that you don't run away from me in a relationship with me. It's important for us to get this squarely in our minds that Jesus promises, if you're going to live like me, if you're going to speak about me in a world that doesn't like me and doesn't live like me, just know you're going to be hated and you're going to have to endure that for me. Point number three, write this down. Endure rejection and opposition like Jesus. Endure rejection and opposition like Jesus. Both of those things. Rejection comes first. Opposition comes second. Jesus says they rejected me and then they opposed me. When they reject the disciples, we see the book of Acts, they reject the disciples, many of them. Then what happens is they're opposed by them. There might be people that you've never shared the gospel with that when you do, they might reject you, but not oppose you. But then if you keep doing that, at some point they might start opposing you and keeping you from talking to other people. I want you to write this down. Hebrews chapter 12, verses three and four. Hebrews 12, three and four, talks about what Jesus did. It says, consider him, think about Jesus who endured from sinners such hostility. People hated him. Consider that so that you might now grow weary or faint-hearted. Don't you get scared. In your struggle against sin, you have not even resisted to the point of shedding your blood. How many of us have been, had, had blood shed because we live for Jesus? Because we stood up for Jesus? How many, where, where are your scars? Where, where are your scars where people beat you up? Like, you don't have them. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. These people, they have not even shed blood, yet still they're caving to the world. And they're, they're, they're afraid of the world. I think that, that kind of is like us too, isn't it? If we cave to the world, it's not because people are, are, are murdering us or killing us. It's because we, we haven't even shed blood. What blood have you shed for Jesus, right? I'm not saying you have to go out and try to shed blood for Jesus. That's not the point. But the point is, he's saying it hasn't even gotten that bad yet for these Hebrews. It hasn't got that bad for us yet either. So when people make fun of us, is that a big deal? Yeah, it, it hurts. When people don't invite you to, back to the parties anymore and the friend groups anymore, does that hurt? Yeah, it, it does. That's real. Not diminishing that at all. In fact, Jesus is saying, and he's taking that very seriously by warning that. But also, if we're going to live for Jesus, we got to know that's coming. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter said something similar. He said, for this you've been called. This is what you've been called to. Because Jesus Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Basically, if Jesus suffered, you're going to suffer. Jesus said that himself in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. He says, if you're going to live righteously, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted, who are rejected for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you. That means to speak angry and evil things about you. People might make up stories about you that are not true because they know you're a Christian. They might do that. Jesus says, if that happens, know that you're blessed or, or rewarded by God. They might utter all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Then he says, you should rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right? If you want to be like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or Jeremiah or Elijah or Elisha or even Moses and David, you want to be like them, well, just know they were all opposed by people. They're all persecuted by people. And even for us, what's even greater than that, Jesus was opposed by people. You want to be like Jesus and aligned with him, then you're just going to be opposed. That's just how it is. It is kind of like wearing a jersey from a team. But in this sense, you might go to a, a game and not know if your team's going to win, right? You might risk being booed out of the stadium. You might risk a lot of those things, but you're, you're wearing that jersey of the rival team in someone else's stadium because you love the team and devoted to the team or whatever, but you don't know if they're going to win. They might not win. They might lose. The thing about putting on the jersey of Christ is you can know for certain that Jesus will win in the end. 
And that should give you all the confidence in the world. It should give me all the confidence in the world. It should give all of us the confidence to live like Jesus in a world that doesn't like him and to even speak for him. That should give us confidence that we can endure whatever because we know he's going to win. Let's pray about that right now.